back, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to Idmid Pharmaceuticals channel, a leader in the manufacturing, development, and commercialization of rare cannabinoids. Uh, joining us today, we have Chief Executive Officer, as always, Eric Adams. Welcome back, sir. Great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Always a pleasure to have you back on. So last we spoke, we kind of got a brief introduction to the company, a little bit of your history and your team. But today, I really want to hone in on exactly what's going on under the hood there at InMid. So we're going to kind of slide through some of your decks. And first and foremost, I guess we'll get an introduction to the rare cannabinoid uh, manufacturing, exactly what rare cannabinoids you guys are after. Sure. Yeah. So uh, first of all, let's start with, you know, what are cannabinoids and what are rare cannabinoids, just to make sure we understand the difference there. So uh, the uh, marijuana plant has this class of compounds called cannabinoids. It manufactures naturally over 140 different individual uh, compounds. Now, most people are familiar with THC and CBD. You've probably heard those abbreviations before. Those are what we call the major cannabinoids, and they're made in very large amounts in the plant, and it's easy to extract them. Uh, and because of that, uh, they've been researched uh, pretty extensively over the last 30 or 40 years. And people understand quite well, you know, the, the physiological effect on the human body. Now, there's all these other ones that are made of very, very low quantities in the plant. We call those the rare cannabinoids. Uh, again, there's close to 140, if not more. Um, and all of these will have some effect in the human body, um, but it's often very different from what you'll see from THC or CBD. And, and the best example is that THC is the only one that gives you uh, a euphoric uh, effect that, that's intoxicating. Uh, the rest of them haven't been shown to, to do that. Uh, there may be another minor cannabinoid in the mix, but, but generally um, it's recognized that THC is the only one that does that. So now you have all these other rare cannabinoids uh, in the plant. And uh, you know, we set out to understand what their physiological potential is, both from a pharmaceutical drug development standpoint and also from a health and wellness standpoint. Uh, which is where you see a lot of CBD being used right now. Um, so if you slide to the, uh, the next slide there, um, we could talk about how we manufacture these. Now, the plant itself utilizes a combination of what we've, we would call biosynthesis, as well as chemical synthesis itself to, to make all these different um, cannabinoids in the plant. So um, the, the problem with the rare ones is it's too expensive to try and extract them from the plant. Uh, so we're using modern uh, pharmaceutical uh, drug manufacturing technologies in order to uh, access them. So, you know, extraction, which you can do, like I said, with CBD and THC, you know, that's, uh, that's a technology from the 1700s. Um, you know, we tried to jump forward and use uh, modern chemical synthesis and biosynthesis techniques to mimic what the plant is actually doing. So what's the difference between these two? Biosynthesis is basically uh, a fermentation process where you're using uh, a, a gene code to get bacteria or, um, uh, or, or other uh, yeast, uh, things like that to manufacture the cannabinoid for you. Uh, chemical synthesis is pretty straightforward. You just take the molecules and you start building them together uh, until you get to the structure that you're looking for. Um, and we have a, a third one that, that we've been working on at InMed called Integrasyn. And Integrasyn, uh, is kind of a combination of those two. It's part, you know, genetic enzyme, un enzyme uh, it's part chemical synthesis. Now, why do we have all three of these and, and why is that important? Well, when we acquired Bay Medica last year, they are experts in chemical synthesis as well as yeast biosynthesis. Uh, and we on the InMed side are experts in E. coli biosynthesis uh, and we have developed this integrasin. So now we have this full range of manufacturing capabilities that we can pick and choose depending on uh, which one's gonna be best for an individual cannabinoid. So there's three questions you basically have to ask. First of all is which cannabinoid are you trying to make? And you have to understand the structure of it because that will maybe point you in one direction or another. Uh, secondly, how much of it do you want to make? Do you want to make a huge amount or do you want to make a small amount? And third, what is the quality you want to make it at? And so once you've answered those three questions, you know which one of these manufacturing techniques are going to be most economical, uh, you know, potentially the quickest uh, or, or the best for what you're trying to accomplish. So we've now utilized that uh, know-how to build a portfolio of uh, rare cannabinoids for the consumer health and wellness space. So these are over-the-counter products. We make the bulk ingredient and we sell it to people who then put it into formulations, who then determine how they want to market it and, and what format they want to sell it in. Is it, a, is it a gummy? Is it a powder? Is it a, you know, what, what have you? Um, so uh, Baymedic has been very successful at understanding how to scale these, these compounds up 
and make them a very large commercial scale because understanding the chemistry, for instance, is one thing you need to know, but understanding the manufacturing process and how to make these at large scale is a completely different skill set, and they have both. So thus far, we've launched three rare cannabinoids. Um, that includes CBC, CBT, and CBDV. Um, those are in the market now. Um, and we have a pipeline of additional ones that we're working on. Uh, the really interesting one there is THCV, which seems to be in very high demand. And despite the fact that it has the initials THC in it, uh, it's not uh, intoxicating. Uh, it actually does pretty much the opposite of what THC does. Uh, at least that's what, what uh, in investigations have shown. So it's a very uh, high demand uh, cannabinoid and we're looking forward to launching that in the next little bit here. So now we have this nice portfolio of uh, rare cannabinoids that we supply as a raw ingredient uh, to other manufacturers uh, who then take it and, and put it into the products that they market uh, uh, to consumers. And kind of moving into that pipeline side of the business, you were kind of honing in on two uh, developments, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of just get a brief overview of these uh, with EB first and foremost, and then we'll talk a little bit about glaucoma. So how are you building out uh, some of these uh, you know, chemicals and uh, these molecules for this specific disease? Right. So everything I just talked about is for the health and wellness consumer market. We also have pharmaceutical drug development, which is a much longer timeline, which is a, you know expensive undertaking. You go through the uh the the clinical trials uh and you you know seek fda approval uh, for use of a compound um we are looking at uh, two applications of the same rare cannabinoid called cbn uh, or cannabinol uh, the first one is in uh, this rare genetic uh, skin condition called uh, epidermolysis bullosa or just eb uh, it's a very devastating uh, rare condition uh, where the integrity of the skin um, is not what it should be. It's not normal. So it's very easy to tear the skin, uh, to uh, have wounds, to have blisters, um, and it in impacts you know, the, the quality and the duration of life. Um, what we're looking to do is, is kind of twofold. First of all, we know that cannabinol can treat a lot of the symptoms that are associated with this devastating condition, things like pain, itch, uh, inflammation and wound healing. So that's what we're trying to do is set out to uh, demonstrate its capabilities through these series of clinical trials, uh, which we're, we're in the middle of right now. Um, so that's a very interesting application. Um, so from the systematic, uh, uh, sorry, symptomatic side, uh, we think that it can be a very important compound. There's also uh, some science that underlies the fact that CBN may be disease modifying uh, in a certain subset of patients. That's going to take a longer to suss out. It's going to take longer trials. Uh, but essentially, uh, CBN can increase the uh, amount of certain kinds of um, uh, compounds in the in the skin that that increase the the um, uh, binding between the epidermis and the dermis. And so we're looking at whether or not CBN can actually modify this disease in, in some patients, which would be uh, tremendous. Uh, so this, this uh, program, if you go to the next slide, we're currently in uh, phase two studies uh, in Europe, uh, enrolling a number of patients, and uh, we're, we're at 13 different sites in eight countries. So we're, we're trying to enroll patients, we're trying to demonstrate the capabilities um, of, uh, of CBN uh, in symptom relief. Um, we've, we've done several, you know, safety trials. It's a very safe compound. Now we're just trying to prove the efficacy of it. Now, moving forward as well, you guys are getting involved with glaucoma, which has been somewhat uh, in tandem with, uh, you know, the, the cannabis sector for some time. So how are you guys approaching this? Yeah, so most people have heard of glaucoma. Um, it's caused by the increase of fluid at the front of the eye, as you can see here, um, and as that fluid builds up, either because of overproduction of the fluid or poor drainage of the fluid, uh, it exerts this pressure through the eye. So that in and of itself can be very painful. It can affect your, your, um, your vision and, and your day to day. But over time, this pressure has a, a more severe effect. And that is it starts to kill the nerves at the back of the eye. Um, and I tell people, if you just push your finger down on your desk and hold it there all day, you know, if you pick your finger up at the end of the day, you're not gonna have any feeling in that finger. Well, over time, this becomes permanent and it's similar um, to what's going on in the eye. So it, it leads to irreversible blindness. 
most of the drugs out there are pretty good at reducing the fluid. And we've seen several cannabinoids that are good at reducing the fluid uh, in the front of the eye. Uh, they increase the drainage of it um, and thereby reducing it and, and the, the associated pressure. But one of the really interesting things we saw about CBN in particular uh, which we did not see with a whole panel of other cannabinoids that we tested, uh, is that it is proactively neuroprotective. So what does that mean? It means that the drug goes to these neurons at the back of the eye and it protects them from death um, and it prolongs their life. So in normal circumstances, um, you're, you're going to uh, potentially you know, extend vision, but in, under these increased pressure uh, uh, instances, it's also going to be very useful in protecting these neurons and, and hopefully uh, preserving vision over a longer period of time. Uh, so that, that work's been really, uh, really good. We're, we're in preclinical testing right now. One of the things we had to do is find a formulation that would deliver uh, the CBN to the eye. And we were able to do that. Um, we, we licensed the technology. Um, uh, and uh, you can see here, this is to depict how much of the drug gets into the front of the eye and how much gets to the back of the eye, which is the two sites where you want to have an effect in glaucoma on the fluid and on the neurons at the back. So we, you can see here, we found a very nice um, uh, delivery technology that, that gives us this profile of drug delivery. Uh, so, you know, the next steps now are to continue to build the data package so that uh, in about a year's time, we can go to the FDA and say, we've done all of the safety testing. We think this, this drug is safety and, and will potentially have efficacy. And we'd like to now move into human clinical trials. Well, on that note, uh, when we come back, I'm going to start breaking down more of the financing. We'll get into the balance sheet side and what this kind of looks uh, like moving forward from a cost structure, maybe perhaps uh, some of the, the share and cap structure as well. But on that note, I definitely appreciate your time today, Eric, and giving us these insights. So I want to pass the question off to the viewers at this point. We'd love to know what you guys think about all of this in that comment section below. Consider subscribing because as news comes down the wire, we'll start to update you here. But stay cool, stay awesome. And as always, I look forward to catching you in the next one. Mm -hmm.